Hello, my name is Rita Valenti, and I am the host of the Public Health Pulse podcast series. We are so happy to be interviewing Cara Page, Edgar Rivera Colon, Rob Wallace, scientist extraordinaire, Lara Germanis, physician and author of the People CDC External Pandemic Review, Dr. Sal Sandoval, practicing public health in the Valley of Southern California, John V. Devashi, medical student, and Tamika Middleton, who brings it all home as the managing director of the Women's March with We Can't Reform Our Way Out of This. Welcome to the exciting Public Health Pulse podcast series. Hello, Rob Wallace. It is so terrific to have you here, my colleague, with the People's CDC. And I, I want to start with a big thank you and appreciation to you for your amazing book, The Fault in Our SARS, COVID-19 in the Biden uh, era. And uh, I wanted to, to share with our audience how you have brought in this book uh, a love of humanity and a unity with the love of science. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, and just to share, if nobody believes me, I just want to share one little thing that you wrote. Um, we must attempt a stab at acting beyond these constraints as an affirmation that humanity is worth it all despite this hideous moment. These struggles are a means of discovering the ways in which we all, that we all read, write, see, hear, might meet up with the acts we need to turn wishful thinking into a better world. There is then a leap of faith in a science for the people. Um, and we thank you. We thank you, Rob. Um, so getting, uh, before we get into some questions, is there anything else? Uh, let me share a little bit with our audience too, uh, uh, about your bio. Um, Rob Wallace is a co-founder co of Agroecology and Rural Economics Research Corps and Pandemic Research for the People. He is a founder of the People's CDC, one of many. He is the author of Big Farms Make Big Flu, and most recently, the critically important in the the excerpt I just read from the book, The Fault in Our SARS, COVID-19 in the Biden area, Era. He has consulted uh, for the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, and as I've mentioned, is an active contributor to the People's CDC with a weekly weather, weather report, among other uh, great skills. Rob, have you got anything else you want to add from your where are you, Minnesota? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm up here in St. Paul, Minnesota, and uh, it's uh, you know weird weather, or the very characteristic of the time of year where it's uh, gotta wear a winter jacket on one side of the street and you're sweating on the other. So it, uh, <laughs> you know how that is. But uh, um, thank you very much for the introduction. I appreciate it, and I, I'll take that question as where am I as being more than geographic. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I can uh, tell you a little bit about how I got here sure. to a science for the people. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, trained as an evolutionary biologist, so I study the evolution of organisms and animals, and but I focus on on uh, infectious diseases like uh, bacteria and viruses. So I'm something of an evolutionary epidemiologist. I study how these pathogens evolve and spread. And uh, so I got into uh, understanding that these kind of pathogens also um, are, are responding to how humanity uh, builds society. So I uh, kind of moved to a world in which I kind of relate the natural sciences, you know, the uh, biology that I'm involved with, uh, with all the other uh, kind of study of the of what we are doing as a, uh, as people in terms of how we construct our world. So I got into kind of the social sciences as well, and put those two together. And, and in the course of doing that, I've been uh, studying a bunch of pathogens that kind of uh, represent the very much the the recent era of uh diseases i started off in working on hiv uh, particularly how the virus uh evolves and spreads in response to uh kind of the social and racial dynamics in new york city 
uh, particularly in an era when the new highly active uh, antiretroviral therapies, the heart uh, uh, combination therapies were introduced, the, the therapies that kind of drive the HIV below uh, point of detection. And uh, it was very much in the early uh, years in the 90s, uh, you know, some parts of New York City got the new drugs and some part didn't, and very much structured by uh, disparities in 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 class and race and uh uh those things come up again and again and and one can't study modern uh, diseases without that kind of uh a framework although many people do study it that way but in my view that's not as much of a science for the people as uh, uh a science that kind of integrates those uh that context as well so from HIV, uh, I moved to uh, out to the University of California and worked on uh, bird flu, H5N1. That was the first right. celebrity virus of the uh, of the century, and looked at how it evolved and spread. And I made the mistake of becoming curious about something. It's not always the best move in science. Okay, I know for you think that curiosity is the bedrock of science, but often it's not, especially if you want a career in it. And um, I made the mistake of asking questions about, well, how, how did this, uh, why did this virus evolve in in southeastern China in 1997? And you, I could look at all sorts of genetic sequences for the virus, and you can't find the answer there. So I got into things like the history of agriculture in the region, the kind of economic geography of, of agribusiness, the kind of uh, global dynamics of uh, the circuits of capital, how capital moves from one side of the world to the other. And all these things have profound impact on the evolution and spread of, of not only avian influenza, but other pathogens. The Biden administration uh, is ending the public health emergency that was instituted back in March of 2020. What, in nine days, I believe, on May 11th of this year. Um, could you talk about uh, why you think the pandemic is still with us? Uh, what does it mean that we are discarding um, all of the layered, whether it's non-medical or medical uh, precautions, ending tracking, reporting, free testing, um, uh, insurance for that matter, Medicaid insurance, um, and and the implications of that. Um, Rob, can you share some thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, long story short, and, and then we'll get into a real conversation, but for the one sentence, it's all all food for the COVID virus, SARS-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 is going to love this so much. I mean, uh, um, we uh, here in the United States, uh, we ne never did, did a really good job about uh, handling the public health around uh, COVID-19. We were kind of suffering the kind of American exceptionalism that nothing bad can ever happen to us. Um, and, uh, uh, at, you know, the richest country in the history of the world had basically defunded public health over many decades to a point where, uh, despite, uh, the, the, our brilliance of being able to pat ourselves on the back in terms of how wonderful we are, that in actuality, when confronted with a crisis on our shores, uh, we weren't very good at responding to it at all. So, you know, starting with uh, Donald Trump, uh, it was really a terrible response to this, uh, perhaps not surprising to many of us. Uh, uh, the incompetence uh, was built in uh, from the top down, from the persona uh, in that office, but uh, beyond that, uh, and uh, really uh, an effort to try to pretend that this nothing was wrong. Uh, and of course, you suffer half a million Americans were killed by the virus in that first uh, year that Trump was in office. And so there was an expectation that when Biden got into office uh, and he, he ran on the platform of actually reversing Trump's policy and actually taking on uh, COVID-19 as a real problem. Uh, he presented it in, in almost Rooseveltian terms of, of uh, taking this on and, and as showing big government uh, stepping in when you have a big problem. Right. So the scale of the problem requires a certain scale of response. And so uh, the platform he ran on was uh, not as good as I, I think he could have done it, but there was an element of understanding that uh, we had to do something about this. Uh, and that we were going to honor evidence-based science, right? That we were actually going to follow the science. That's right. He repeatedly talked about the necessity to listen to the scientists in a way that Trump would steamroll not only Fauci, but the entirety of uh of his uh, uh, staff and beyond CDC. Uh, CDC has had deep problems going back decades, but for the most part, uh, any efforts 
uh, from CDC staffing to come up with solutions was basically run off the road, in part because uh, the country's largely organized around uh, an open economy. And uh, frankly, and this is where the people's science comes in, it's about organized around um, making billionaires uh, richer. And so when you have a situation where you have to basically roll back the economy, people have to stay home, uh, uh, people have to wear masks, there have to be more, uh, uh, there should be more uh, uh, OSHA interventions in a way that makes working uh, safer. Uh, these are the kind of things that undercut the capacity uh, to generate profit. Uh, mm-hmm. So, well, at, at the same time, you have uh, such a massive uh, uh, outbreak that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, millions of Americans being infected, millions of Mar- Americans being disabled by long COVID. You have, uh, although we didn't know that at the time, that first year, uh, it certainly come uh, to our uh, realization of the damage that it's causing. Uh, as many as 36 million Americans are suffering some version of long COVID. Uh, we've got 1.1 million Americans dead. So we have the half a million Americans uh, that were killed under Trump. Biden gets into office. But by by May of 2021, the Biden administration is done with COVID because they right. realize that the capacity necessary, uh, the scale at which they need to deal with the problem was beyond the capacity of an American government that is presently organized around getting the rich richer. Uh, in essence, they needed they could not uh, get on board with uh, uh, expanding the public commons necessary to really take on a virus and drive it down within six months time. A real public health program could do that. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, problems with the Chinese, but uh, countries around the world, not just China, but New Zealand and Vietnam and Iceland and Uruguay uh, were in the first year, even before the vaccines were implemented, able to drive down COVID to, to nothing. So there was an uh, an acceptance of this level of death at the altar of private profits. It's essentially how the COVID uh, initial COVID response was. That's right. So this is when, uh, you know, at this point in May 2021, uh, the CDC basically says that people with, who are vaccinated don't have to wear masks anymore. And this is at a time when they're very much very clear of the Delta variant was emerging in India that was already very much dangerous. And like the original uh, uh, path, uh, COVID-19 out of China, uh, we had fair warning that this thing was on its way. So uh, 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 Biden was uh, very much desperate to be able to get the um uh, the response to the pandemic all wrapped up by July 4th, uh, 2021. He called it the Independence Day. That did not go well. Didn't work. Uh, so by the uh, beginning of 2022, the Biden administration took a the realized that, that if they wanted to wind down the COVID response, they would have to uh, take a, the long road uh, over the course of 2022, rolling back both the, uh, the social programs, some of which you mentioned, everything from... Uh, 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 some uh, uh, money for people for unemployment, uh, money for people to uh, for if they have kids uh, to help them with during the pandemic, the eviction moratoriums, all those things were uh, on the social end of things was first rolled back uh, to the point that uh, eventually uh, it, it started cutting, cutting into the uh, programs that allowed people to be uh, uh, vaccinated for free and uh, access to antivirals and uh, and the like. So it, the kind of the bedrock of the tools they kept talking about that we had that could deal with COVID. And so therefore, we didn't need to do any more of the uh, uh, sheltering in place or any of the uh, protections uh, at work or or any of those things like that. So yeah, uh, yeah go ahead. I, I was just going to say, um, I mean, I'm a registered nurse, and I know the struggle that nurses and other healthcare providers went through in terms of uh, getting uh, protective equipment, PPE equipment, uh, to be able to uh, remain safe on the job. Uh, and in the early days of the pandemic, the many demands that came up, including um, releasing people in uh, congregate facilities, uh, jails, um, the situation in nursing homes where, you know, uh, in in prisons the and in detention centers, the virus just was rampant. And I, I want to... Um, comment on a couple of things. Uh, One that has been true throughout the pandemic and something that's relatively new. I understand that there was a hospital, I believe in California, that lifted its mask mandate and almost immediately had a COVID outbreak, which they did not want to call an outbreak, right? 
But it's also true, and it's also true, that people are still getting infected. People are still dying. Uh, we are happy. We are very happy that the rate and the, the the quantity is appears to be decreasing. But particularly, uh, there are certain communities that have borne the brunt of this uh, pandemic, especially essential workers who tend to be disproportionately black, people of color, immigrants, the elderly, um, and folks with certain disabilities. And it's as if it's okay for those people to get sick, potentially die, and or develop COVID, uh, long COVID, which is uh, a, a, a frightening inflammatory process that can really impact you. Uh, and we don't even know for how long, because there are still some things that are new. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit uh, about the dis disparity, inequity, the 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 white supremacy really uh uh and and ableism that has uh impacted uh the pandemic before we go into some ideas about what we can do <laughs> right right well those are those are excellent points i mean uh uh covid spreads into a a, a country as it as the country is and and as the country has become so think of it as uh, when a pathogen uh, spreads, you kind of think of it as uh, water going through cracks in ice. And so it's finding the cracks in the in the in the society that uh, have been there uh, since the beginning of the country. Look, the country was founded on slavery and genocide That's and it rolled it over into apartheid and an apartheid system that's still in place, except save in name only. But all the disparities that were built out of that are, are remain in place. And so uh, you could see it in terms of the numbers, uh, uh, black and brown people suffering the worst of consequences, both in infections and, and the damage. And in part, that damage comes from uh, 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 suffering the, uh, uh, the many of the preconditions uh, before the virus ever arrived that uh, the SARS-2, the virus feeds on. So uh, things like diabetes, uh, all these other uh, conditions can lead to a worst case of COVID. And then on the other side of it, uh, uh, by virtue of, of being subjected to uh, many of the uh, stressors of, of being uh, black and brown in a country that is based on white supremacy and, and class war, uh, that leads to the, the damage on the other side of the infection. And so the, the numbers are uh, unequivocal about it, uh, of the way, uh, the extent to which black and brown people have suffered the worst of consequences. And of course, as you brought up, uh, you know, essential workers, but also very much in the weather and the manufacturing sector. Uh, you know, many of the uh, workers in uh, the meat processing plants are, are black and brown, uh, uh, suffer the worst of consequences uh, of those outbreaks in the slaughterhouses uh, that were kept open uh, by the Trump administration. Uh, uh, but also in service industries, uh, all the way to, to restaurants and, and other uh, places that uh, remained open. Uh, many of them remained open to uh, feed people in, in a way that uh, uh, whether you're you're cooking on the on the line in the cook uh, back in the kitchen or you're, you're servicing up front, uh, those people were uh, unceremoniously uh, de uh, uh, treated in such a way that they suffered the worst of consequences. That leads to, uh, you know, people who are infected on the job, they bring it back home. Housing is uh, great disparities in housing, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, ownership and and uh, rentals in a way that people have families have to double up in, uh, in order to be able to, you know, uh, live in a society where you have to give 50 percent or more of your salary to rent. Uh, that leads to the kind of uh, uh, increasing uh, likelihoods of, of infection. So like a uh, you know, uh, people weren't able to be able to stay home. Like a, a lot of uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the uh, 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 white collar uh, folk who were able to uh, commute uh, online. Uh, some things you can't do online, you know, uh, and uh, the very uh, heartbeat of the country depends on working people uh, going to work and getting stuff done. But uh, they uh, very much deserve the protections they didn't receive. They very much deserve the kind of hazard pay that uh, sort of came in and then was disappeared. Um, so uh, uh, very much so, um, uh, sometimes pandemics uh, act as a, a mirror of um, 
of the country in which the the virus arrives in. So the uh, you know the the uh, the demographics of the people who suffer the worst of this uh, reflect uh, uh, the state of the country. Um, so uh, you're absolutely correct. Um, the disparities that were present before the virus arrived, uh, if not only just didn't reflect uh, those disparities, but amplified them uh, in such a way that uh, the you know percent of uh, uh, black and brown people, and that goes down even to the kids, uh, were, uh, were much more greater in terms of the, the damage that COVID caused them. Right. I mean, we had a, a, a situation here where a uh, so-called nonprofit uh, which really wasn't the case, hospital chain uh, with uh, has about seven hospitals in his chain, closed two of them uh, in working class black communities uh, in, you know, during during the pandemic. And not only were those hospitals closed, but also all of the doctor's offices that were part of that campus, leaving roughly 10,000 people without any access um, to health care. At the same time, uh, the the uh, money is, is being poured into uh, the creation of a cop city that is also deforesting the land. So, Rob, what I'm hearing you saying is that all of these things are connected in a society that's, that's a, a class society that's organized around profit. You know, the notion that, of course, uh, medical doctors are, uh, and medical systems are absolutely necessary. Uh, the fact that they're closing down leads to considerable damage to whole communities. Uh, but uh, so your your relationship with your doctor is not just an individual thing, uh, event or, or relationship. It's uh, part and parcel is that all those things add up to a, a community that's of, of better health if, if people are treated right in that way, if they have access to health care, if it's not uh, 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 for profit, uh, if, you know, if it's uh, uh, access to health care should be as, as uh, uh, much a part of uh, our uh, social being as access to clean water. Uh, you mm. know, it's uh, it should be all that should be free. I know people also people around the country do pay for water, but for the most part, uh, these things are at the root of uh, how we act as a society, not only in matters of uh, moral justice, but uh, in very functional terms, uh, very pragmatic terms of like, uh, as I brought up before, the health of uh, of uh, our, our brothers and sisters in, in various directions, uh, wherever they are, uh, is very much integrated with our own health. And that that is uh, absolutely necessary. And, uh, you know, the uh, your illness from COVID is not a matter of a moral failing on your part. It's like you were sent to work, you were put in conditions not of your choosing, and you were forced to work in a situation that led to your being infected. And then by virtue of uh, doubling up in your household, that forced uh, the spread of the infection to other people in your household. And so it's not it's not about the personal decisions you made. It has nothing to do with that. The, the system is directed toward trying to get you to think along those lines, because mm -hmm. it wants to wash its hands of its responsibility for the damage it causes. Because if you invest in public health and public commons, uh, then in essence, uh, you're basically not using that money to pay off a billionaire. It's to me, it's it's so much about valuing life over over commodity or over the commodification even even of healthcare. And you know, finally, you know the 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 challenge, and I think. Um, moving forward is this question of trust. How do we, how do we, as as concerned, uh, loving, caring people, um, scientists or artists, whatever, or or media experts, whatever we are. How do we uh, begin to address the fact that the institutions that we're supposed to uh, guard uh, or protect or assist society uh, in public health have uh, have been so thoroughly compromised uh, economically and politically that there that this question of trust is floating all over the place in society and science has always um, you know you would like to think that science has had roots that can develop trust um, and so that's part of I think you know uh, some of the great 
uh, well, some of the appreciated uh, work that the People's CDC has done, but it's also a very long haul. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the uh, uh, trust is an epidemiological variable, meaning it is a it is like it it's not just about the virus or vaccines. Like if people don't want to take the vaccines because they distrust the vaccines or distrust distrust the government. Uh, then the vaccine's going to fail. So it doesn't matter how efficacious the vaccine is in a laboratory or a clinic, its effectiveness goes to, uh, down the toilet if it's uh, people don't want to take it. And so, uh, you know, it, it isn't, it's never merely a, about numbers of, of vaccines and people infected. It, it has people are people and they have to be treated uh, in, the, in humane fashion. And this is where. The Biden administration figured a little bit some of this out at the beginning before he took office uh, this round. Uh, he he in his plans for uh, uh, confronting the pandemic, he had uh, basically uh, was going to put money in in a direction of of hiring a hundred thousand uh, community health workers that would go door to door or farm right. to farm and try right. to convince see check in on people, right. convince them to take the vaccine. Now here's the problem: a hundred thousand was never going to be enough. <laughs> and there's a dashboard uh, that one of the universities had that basically you can check your area, see how many people are infected and see how many estimated uh, community health workers you needed. And I use that for St. Paul and Minneapolis here. And we needed 6,000 of those health workers just for our, our two cities here. So 100,000 was never going to be enough. And he was never going to get that money from uh, a split Congress, particularly the Republicans. So it really just speaks about... It's not just about political party. It's about uh, the state we are in the country uh, in this cycle of, of accumulation where people, the rich are cashing out and they're buying up the public commons or selling it off. So, but we needed the, those number of people. Uh, uh, we needed at least 10 times of that, at least a million community health workers hired as other countries did. Um, they hired a lot of people to go door to door, check in on people. And you have to, that help, that's the mechanism by which to build trust. Now, I know this country is very uh, uh, inundated with the kind of libertarian instinct and inundated with anti-government instincts. And the first time a community health worker knocks on a door, uh, the person behind there is probably going to say, F you, get, get off my lawn, right? You know, and it's going to happen the next two or three days, too. But if you got to keep showing up and 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 find and perse perseverance necessary to get to the point Oh, this is the community health worker, uh, and you start waving at each other, and you do you develop a, a means by which to have a conversation, and many of those conversations won't go anywhere, but many of them will. Right. And you get to a point to have the conversation to talk about what this vaccine is. This is why, unlike the Biden administration, I do not blame the unvaccinated for the outbreak. Right. right. This is a total mistake they made. Right. They did to the red states what Trump administration to do the blue states and they were interested in dividing and conquering the country yes, for yes. electoral Fair purposes enough. instead of the well-being of, of the american people because now don't get me wrong they're the right wing uh radio talk show ho hosts some of them who died of covid i do not uh, mourn their passing in part because they convinced millions of americans not to get vaccinated mm -hmm. so they they those people i don't have any sympathy for it but the unvaccinated were victimized in the sense of they were they were basically let let go to die. And Biden was OK with that. And that's a deep problem. Uh, you cannot abandon uh, the, uh, you know, half the American people because you happen to disagree with them. A lot of things. And, and don't get me wrong. They're like people I will not work with. I will not work with fascists. Uh, I will not work with white supremacists if I can avoid it. Right. Uh, but then in the end. Uh, much of the American people are really upset about the state of the country, and uh, uh, we want to be able to uh, reintegrate people into the sense of community and that they're not being abandoned. And uh, and the objection to the vaccines was an expression of uh, discontent and uh, disappointment and anger at how they've been treated. And so what you need to do is uh, you need to uh, reintroduce uh, people into the, the con uh, public commons and so that they are allowed to uh, um, uh, not only survive, but thrive. And so uh, in a practical way, uh, the million uh, community health workers you hired is would be a declaration of commitment to them beyond the pandemic, meaning you can't just go back 
to the normal, as you brought up, that caused the damage in the first place. You have to uh, go um, uh, evolve into a society that basically is going to treat people uh, with the kindness and respect that they deserve. You know, on that note, I mean, I could I could have this conversation with you for the entire afternoon. Um, I and I would love to, and maybe we can do it off off camera. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to say a couple of things. A, I wanted to say thank you, thank you for sharing your brilliance. Thank you for the work with the People's CDC. Thank you all for this book. Y'all need to. Yeah, this is a this book is an anthology of different essays, and it will blow you away to see the way that Rob has integrated uh, so much of what society overall is confronting now. And the last thing I wanted to say was you you use the words persistence, perseverance, ongoing. We're in a marathon, right? I mean, there are sprints inside this marathon, but we are in a, a marathon uh, of opportunity, I think, um, where uh, I know something that has always been close to my heart was the U.S. Social Forum, where we, uh, you know, understood another world is possible. And now I think we're also beginning to understand another world is necessary. Um, and I want to thank you for sharing those those thoughts with us today. Do you have any last thoughts um, for for our conversation today? And well, you express I things beautifully. I, I would only add that uh, indeed, it, it is very much a marathon, and uh, you know the the odds seem against us on so many fronts. But uh, uh, it's remarkable the way uh, uh, um, multiple futures are are in development. We see the worst ones uh, apparent uh, on the day to day from these outbreaks that, as you brought up, will continue beyond COVID. Uh, also, climate change, but there are alternate futures also in play. There are millions of people around the world who are engaged in alternate uh, versions of doing agriculture that will uh, mm -hmm. not only feed us well uh, nutritiously, but uh, keep these path pathogens from emerging in the first place. And so, uh, uh, that kind of uh, international spirit. Uh, uh, connecting with people around the world who are doing wonderful things, uh, that connection with people here in the United States. I mean, there's massive distrust and, and despair and hate right now, and uh, uh, we need to move in a direction that uh, reverses that. Uh, but it involves uh, recognizing uh, that that uh, hate and despair is, is being uh, weaponized uh, against the American people, and that uh, to, to side on this on, on the side of uh, solidarity and love is is the the way we need to go. Thank you so much. Um, it's hard to say goodbye, but um, I think we have to. <laughs> so, um, and we'll see you again. And uh, you know, as we've said before, this is going to be a podcast series of seven to ten other folks, and we'll be bringing uh, bringing it all back uh, to, to the people. Thank you, Rob, so much. Thank you. Dr. Lara Germanis, lead author of the People's CDC External Pandemic Review, explores the meaning of a culture of solidarity in the era of pandemics. Her presentation confronts an inequitable hospital system organized to profit and protect itself at the expense of our collective health and well-being. And with no further ado, let me introduce Dr. Lara Germanis to you. Uh, Lara is a family physician at the Cambridge Health Alliance and a clinical instructor at Harvard Medical School and faculty at the uh, CHA Centers for Health Equity, Education, and Advocacy. She founded and coordinates the Massachusetts Coalition for Health Equity that advocates for an equitable response to the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. She is a member of the People's CDC and lead author of the People's CDC External Review, Too Many Deaths, Too Many Left Behind. Welcome, Dr. Germanis. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Just fine, just fine. Thank you. Do you have anything you'd like to add to your uh, your impressive work over the years for health <laughs> equity and health justice? Uh, I know you're a mom. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yes, I'm a mom of two delightful and amazing children that keep me going. Um, and you know, that's what really brings me here today is thinking about 
And I think the thing that we should all be asking ourselves, you know, in the wake of the pan of, of you know, the, the first three years of the pandemic, which I think left us a, lo a lot of us thinking about what really matters to us, the kinds of social interactions that we want to have and 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 the world that we want to co-create. Um, and I also just want to say um, I'm listed as uh, you have me listed as the. Um, as a as a founder, I'm definitely a co-founder. There are a number of other people that founded the group, so I don't want to take total credit. Um, and uh, yes, I, I think that's that's really what why I'm here. It's why I've been doing this work. And I'll say, you know, I've spent the last twenty years um, organizing in Massachusetts. Um, you know, I've done I've done work in Brazil and Lebanon as well. Um, global health work and community based participatory research and. Um, you know, I came into the field of medicine because I wanted to create social change and because I really wanted to be able to, with my own two hands, bring people who are the most marginalized the care that they deserve. And as I watch the CDC um, sharing information that is harmful to people um, and and issuing guidance that is harming people many times over, well, I realized it doesn't really make sense to be sitting in a clinic one-on-one -on -one doing patient care um, unless we're also speaking out and making sure that the health policies in our nation are are protecting people's lives, not hurting people's lives. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for all of that work. And getting sort of right into the People's CDC External Review, which is a broad scope of the role that the uh, CDC under the Biden administration has played during the uh, first three years of this pandemic. Could you talk a little bit about the why and uh, uh, what and about how uh, the external review came about? Absolutely. So in April 2022, the uh, CDC announced that it was conducting its own internal review to take a look at the way that it had per performed amid a significant number of voices that were crit criticizing the way that the CDC has managed the pandemic. Biden came into office with a plan to beat COVID-19. And then suddenly, a couple months in, all of a sudden, they just announced that the um, the map was going to be changed um, from all red to all green, that it was no longer a big deal to try and prevent COVID, even though it was still the third leading cause of death um, and was disabling millions of people uh, due to long COVID. And also because it's simply a novel virus. Um, every time I'm speaking with a member of the media or an elected official, and they they say to me, you know, well, what do you think is going to happen? These these experts are saying, oh, COVID's much milder now. The first thing I ask them is, do you have a crystal ball? <laughs> I in my medical training, nobody gave me the power to tell the future. If I want a psychic, I mean, I'll I'll go I'll go find one. But I'm a doctor. My job is to analyze medical information that is before me and to be humble about the things that I don't know. And I can't see the future. So I can't tell you about all of the things that we don't yet know a novel virus causes or of the variants that could be coming that could be more or less severe. And therefore, it is important for us to be taking a look fully at um, the CDC's management of the pandemic. And I'll say, um, overall, we've seen, you know, some really major red flags in the way that the CDC has managed the pandemic downplaying the severity of COVID, downplaying how easy it is to spread COVID, and then also being moved and basing guidelines on political concerns and, um, and following pressure from business interests, rather than on their very own very excellent science. And that is, um, you know, after seeing a number of these episodes, I think another big one that, um, you know, that I, I even think the general public has has been really aware of is the changing of the COVID isolation from 10 days to five days mm -hmm. after the Delta CEO contacted them formally in a letter and said, you know, please, we have staffing shortages. Can you decrease the quarantine and isolation period? And I just think back to actually a patient that I had a few months back and I, she had COVID and I warned her, you know, 
watch out, uh, though, you, you still can be infectious after five days. And she says, oh, yeah, yeah, I know. If this is I just think that was just about getting us back to work. Mm. Like, you know, people get it. People see through it. But but we need to be basically documenting and calling this out. And and that inspired us to do this work. I think that the people of this country, the people of the world deserve to have good information. And um, I'll say, actually, I was on the um, on a call this morning with a state legislator and I told him, you know, because he kind of said, well, we've really left it to the experts to advise us. And I am not, you know, in a position to be analyzing medical information. And it's true. I mean, analyzing medical information and public health information is really can be quite complicated. You know, one study could say this, another study could say that. And so you do need somebody to present to you the entirety of the literature mm -hmm. and then say, you know, this is what the literature says. But then we have to be able to explain it to the people in a way that enables people to make decisions that impact, impact their lives and allows policymakers to make policy in ways that protect people's lives rather than corporate interests. And in this case, it's not been happening in this country. Unfortunately, the uh, corporate interests have been really um, shaping our country's COVID policy uh, much, much more than considerations about public health. I really appreciate that that kind of overview. I know that the uh, external review um, focused in on eight key areas of of public health, and I wondered if you could uh, sort of highlight and bring out a little bit more about a few of those key areas, such as. Uh, equity and justice, which I know you have a very long and deep background in, uh, public health infrastructure, what the pandemic has taught us about that or or reignited our interest in what we actually may need, and root causes of the problem, which you're also alluding to in terms of uh, political uh, political interests and corporate interests uh, to narrate an ongoing pandemic away when it's still with us. I wonder if you could share, uh, you know, in particular on some, a little more deeply on a, a few of those areas, Lara. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. I, I first just want to say, I, I think I, um, you know, so the way that we've kind of structured the argument for the, um, for the report, I forgot to mention one of our three red flags was mm. that when we kind of took a step back and said, what is the C CDC doing wrong? Um, we um, had these three red flags. I mentioned two of them. So one is that the CDC has been downplaying the serious threat of COVID. Number two is that they have shifted recommendations following pressure um, from political and business interests. And number three is the CDC has been pushing individual choice over a population health approach to protect everyone. Mm. And that has meant that they have completely abandoned public health. And when you abandon public health, you abandon the most marginalized people first, because you do you always works best for the rich and powerful. And as a result, life expectancy in the U.S. has fallen drastically. And then also, if you look at, um, you know, the life expectancy, though, of people of color, you'll find that that, um, you know, uh, we have suffered two, three, four times um, uh, more uh, the decreases in life expectancy than um, than white non-Hispanic um, population as, as defined by the CDC. So um, so I just wanted to put that out there. You know, we so we we had this process where we brought together a number of public health experts and people with interdisciplinary expertise to take a look at um, uh, and and to really think about what would a pandemic response look like? Um, and those included people with expertise in public health, in you know sociology, in medicine, in anthropology, in health communications, um, disabled people, um, and and people who have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And we um, through what's called a modified Delphi process. Uh, gather together a number of thoughts of, you know, what would a good and equitable pandemic response look like? And then that's how we came up. Eventually, we kind of called it down to eight key areas. And and then we um, wrote, the, so the report is kind of divided. The critique is um, focused on those different ways. And it's, you know, it's really hard to separate one from the other. Um, but ethics, and um, you know, equity and justice are really just all 
inextricable from each other because the only right response, and I think this is something we heard a lot at the beginning of the pandemic, was that, um, you know, everyone is, um, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And that's still true today, that our pandemic response is only as good um, as it keeps the most vulnerable person safe. And so does our pandemic response at this moment pass that test? Absolutely not. And, um, you know, you need more, no more evidence than to take a look at that tweet from the CDC that came out a few months ago, right after Evusheld, um ceased to be uh, effective against circulating variants. And they essentially told immunocompromised people, um, people whose immune systems aren't working that well, and those who live with them to stay home to avoid COVID infection. Um, All right, so I'm a single parent. (laughs) I can't stay home. I need to earn a living. I need childcare. I, I, I mean, and, and I'm, you know, I'm a doctor. <laughs> I'm privileged. Uh, so there's a whole lot of people that can't follow that guidance because of the simple, basic conditions of their lives. Yeah. Um, I was just going to, I was just going to raise up what you said that um, no one is safe until everyone is safe, which harkens back to what Fannie Lou Hamer said, no one is free until everyone is free, which also, you know, by uh, deduction sort of points to the structural inequities that many communities, particularly Black, Indigenous, and communities of color came into the pandemic with uh, in in severe uh, unequal uh, terms. And as a consequence, of course, felt the the, uh, burden of the pandemic uh, the strongest, the the most, uh, particularly with what you said, Lara, about this individual approach to public health, which is a societal issue. Um, mm-hmm. and- Absolutely. Um, you know, the, you, you can't, and this is, this is the thing here is it, I mean, the, this pre- response, it's completely illogical. You can't <laughs> prevent an airborne virus <laughs> alone. You just can't. COVID is airborne. It spreads in the air like smoke. And because of that, people, and actually The other thing is that more than half of COVID transmission happens before people develop symptoms or just without symptoms at all. Mm. So you can catch and spread COVID without even knowing it to people. Mm. And then also because some people have mild symptoms initially, they might just have a sniffle and not have any idea that they're infecting, you know, their beloved grandparent with a deadly virus that will be deadly to them. They may also not know that they have contracted a virus that could give them long COVID and eventually disable them. Again, even after a mild infection, we don't have a lot of information right now about which people are going to be fine after a COVID infection or actually if anybody's going to be fine we just don't know that and um and and you just can't prevent an airborne virus alone um so because when people are in enclosed indoor spaces with each other one way masking is insufficient to prevent virus transmission in those settings I'm, I personally are, am aware of people that have contracted COVID in crowded indoor settings when they were wearing an excellent P100 mask. Mm. And, and so, you know, this whole thing about, oh, well, you can choose to wear a mask that doesn't actually protect you. And then, and then, so, I mean, even the like wealthiest person, <laughs> can have a lot of trouble protecting themselves because they still have to go to the grocery store. I mean, I guess they could pay somebody to shop for them, Um, but (laughs) if they have children and their children, I mean, I need to go to school or at least be socialized somehow with contact with other people. And so they're really like, you know, even with resources, it's difficult. And without resources, I mean, there's a lot of people who, um, can't afford to buy N95 masks, don't even know about them. Um, And and because there's so little uh, access to information out there, people um, who are, you know, working um, like like lower income um, and have less access to um, 
lots of good information about this issue or have even been systematically misinformed. I mean, we've heard things, especially earlier in the pandemic. I remember, you know, there was targeted misinformation going out to immigrant communities about the COVID vaccine and, um, you know, mis and disinformation just being circulated on Twitter. And, 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 and it's really sad too. I mean, people often in this country, uh, Ref, like frame a conversation about the political parties and um you know if you take a look at it like the republican party they should be ashamed of themselves they have blood on their hands the yeah. misinformation that they have spread about covid and about the vaccines i mean you take a look if you take a look, I bet you would find that the vast majority of the Republican senators are vaccinated and boosted, but they're out there lying to their constituents that the COVID vaccine is dangerous. And you pl it plays out in the public health numbers. Those states with more Republican um, you know, support are also have higher mortality rates. That's criminal. Mm -hmm. And it's also interesting that this external review comes during the Biden administration, when we had hopes of of making substantial change and actually looking at issues down the road, what has the pandemic taught us about building a public health infrastructure that is strong and prepared, not only for pandemics, but the kind of chronic uh, health inequities that we experience and see uh, every day. What does this pandemic, what has uh, the external review showed us about the root causes of the pandemic and what kind of recommendations? Um, you know, in a way, what you said, you know, you're on your own. So how are we, you know, particularly with the people's CDC, um, trying to to have conversation about what kind of public health infrastructure do we really need and how do we get at some of these root causes? And I wonder if you could share some of your thoughts on that. Thank you for bringing that up. I mean, absolutely. The American public health system is designed to financially uh, reward illness, not wellness. Um, you know, our fee for service system rewards hospitals for having sicker patients, for doing more procedures rather than for trying to keep the population healthy. Um, you know, if you take a look, I, I think that really, if, if we were fear, if we were serious about trying to protect the American public, we would take a look at the way that other countries with, you know, far fewer resources do a much better job at protecting their population. You know, countries like Cuba, like Costa Rica, you know, even like England, um, that, uh, you know, I, I have family members in England that were getting phone calls to schedule their COVID vaccines. I mean, you, you were able to, uh, at least a few months ago, go into a pharmacy in England and pick up a huge packet of COVID tests um, for, you know, a couple of, uh, for like a dollar or less, or I think actually, no, I think that they were free. I mean, it doesn't, it, this is just, it's all been done for basically the purposes of lining the pockets of big corporations and of big hospitals. And right now, I think that this is so important because, um, we actually have, uh, frankly, a scandal going on in the world of the American hospitals, um, in terms of them trying to rapidly remove COVID and um, infection control protections, which are going to put everybody at risk. And actually, I, I just want to go through this um, point for point because it is very um, concerning. <laughs> um, hospitals in Massachusetts have been secretly pressuring our Department of Public Health to end COVID infection control protections. And hospitals are also stopping screening patients on admission to hospital for elective procedures and also on admission. This means, and, and the, the reasoning behind it was a commentary published in December, 2022 in the Society of Healthcare Epidemiology. The argument behind it was because there are so many other layers of protection in hospital, like masks and ventilation and, and quote unquote um, practices to try and avoid presenteeism among healthcare workers, mm -hmm. we will be able to prevent COVID infections and we do not need to screen. Now they've taken away the masks. They've taken away the tests. 
We also know that hospitals in the first year of the pandemic lost about $22.3 billion postponing elective, pro elective procedures. We understand that some infection control leaders in Boston area hospitals have expressed concerns that in infection control meetings, they are worried that hospitals are continuing to lose money, rescheduling elective procedures when patients test positive for COVID. Hospitals are in an unprecedented budget crisis. So this is very believable that this is a concern. What does it mean if you go into a hospital and you don't get screened for COVID on admission or before your elective procedure? That means that you're in the hospital, you know, recovering, unconscious, in a recovery unit with other patients unmasked, staff unmasked, transmitting COVID asymptomatically, they won't even know that they had it. And because you didn't get tested on admission, you won't be even able to prove that you got COVID in the hospital because you won't have been tested. It's, so it's, if patients want to sue, they won't be able to. It's mind boggling. It's it's absolutely it's absolutely mind boggling how clarifying this is about making reducing everything about healthcare to a commodity and not to the patient's well being. Um, cause you know, I, I think I probably share a vision of the kind of public health infrastructure that we really, we really need to have, which includes, you know, evidence-based science at the root of making decisions and takes out, you know, the profit motive of, of, of hospitals and hospital chains, uh, around healthcare. I mean, we, we experienced a situation here where we lost, uh, a critical level one trauma center that was in uh, a working class black community simply because it didn't make enough money in that community because of high rates of uninsurance and uh, low rates of Medicaid reimbursement, reimbursement, which is another issue, of course, that's happening as the pandemic, as this um so-called end of the pandemic, the end of the public health emergency is coming about, which is, you know, forcing millions and millions of people to reapply for Medicaid when we know that millions of those people, uh, even if they're quote unquote eligible by state standards, won't have, uh, will, will lose their access to Medicaid and therefore become uninsured, where the cost of a rapid test or the cost of a vaccine or the cost of any of a mask uh, becomes uh, uh, un unacceptable. Um, Absolutely. It's all intertwined. I mean, look, yeah. the basic message here is public health. It has to be easy. If it's not easy, people won't do it. Mm. You need to be giving out masks and giving out COVID tests left and right for free. And then people need to be able to get them in the easiest to access spaces. You need to be giving them out in schools, giving them out in clinics, giving them out in libraries, giving them out at the grocery store. You know, wherever people are, that's where they need to get them. When you meet people where they're at, you keep them healthy. And that's why, you know, some of the poorest countries in the Southern Hemisphere, or in the, sorry, I want to say in the Western Hemisphere, have life expectancy is above the United States. I mean, we pay 10 times probably more. I'm not sure the exact statistic, but we pay an astronomical sum much more than any other country in the world on our health care. Yeah. And it is simply because our, our health system is set up to, you know, reward those in profit. Um, pharma, big Pharma is one of the largest, if not the largest lobbying group in Washington. The hospitals are also a huge lobbying group. They have huge financial interests to keep the system the way it is because they are making tons and tons of money. And, and unfortunately, they're doing it by, by, you know, they were, they're rewarded for when people get sicker. I mean, it, it just, if you uncover this, it's like, <laughs> it's like you get to the center of a very smelly onion. Um, 
<laughs> but there's a lot of hope in there. I mean, look at what, you know, I mean, I look at the external review and the amount of work that went into that and the people CDC and efforts of doctors uh, around the country to unionize, nurses fighting for PPE, uh, not only for themselves, but for essential workers as well. So um, any any last words of encouragement of <laughs> of building another way, a different way of of distributing health and healing justice in this country? Absolutely. I think that this is a hugely wonderful moment to be hopeful. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe it's the maybe it's the spring sunshine that's saying this to me. But, um, you know, we we've many of us have been at this for many, many years. And, you know, I still remember the slogan, another world is possible um, from the anti globalization movement. Uh, I think, you know, the thing is that I think that we need to reframe uh, public health and the struggle for health justice as about the care that we all deserve, as a, a caring for each other and solidarity. Um, you know, masking to protect somebody else, that is such a wonderful thing that we can do. You know, um, testing before a gathering to protect a beloved person. That's a wonderful way to show solidarity. Uh, you don't need to, you know, you don't need a degree to save a life, to be honest, these days. And you know, we could we could reframe and turn this messaging all around and work together to build the world that we all want to live in. Do we want to be all teaching our children? You do you, you know, you 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 do you and you'll figure it out. I want to teach my children, you know, we do best when we take care of each other. You know, I take care of you, you take care of me. Um, and I think that one of the most important things that kind of came through in our exploration of the external review was this concept of interdependence. Yeah. Um, you know, interdependence is this is a vital public health concept, and it's a vital concept of solidarity. Nobody is independent. We all need each other to take to to be able to achieve, you know everybody talked about essential workers and essential workers were were disproportionately impacted by the covid pandemic and then you know essential workers and you know usually um people of color and and low income workers and people who are disabled i mean are thought of as this sort of vulnerable class of people that needs to be taken care of or you know that are like siphoning off resources of the economy and that's absolutely not true actually the converse is true you know like people uh who do essential jobs are the foundation of our economy we are all dependent on them our society is interdependent and you cannot remove one person from it we all support each other and if we can build a movement that understands that and and you know help and if and I think, you know, this is something that's also been really important that we've been learning by uh, studying some of the successes of unions, such as the, um, you know, Graduate Students Union at Berkeley and a new recent strike at Rutgers University, who fought for masks and COVID protections in their contracts and then also in their unions. And person by person, people sharing their personal stories about why they need other people to protect them. You know, when you hear, when you're, when you're a good friend, when you're, you know, um, or a beloved person in your life or your coworker tells you, I need your help. I need you to protect me, to keep me safe. It changes everything. And we can build a society where we keep each other safe and we can demand um, a health system and a public health system that gives everybody the care that they deserve and meets everybody where they're at. And that's what we need. And the other thing that we need is to follow um, the science, the actual science. And this is, I think, the, the maybe one of the key points about the external review, because there's all these people saying, you know, oh, like critiquing the CDC. Like the point here is actually not at all to critique the CDC, but rather to say, hey, guess what? The CDC's science is pretty great. Actually, the majority of the citations in the external review or, you know, or a huge minority of them were CDC reports. CDC, follow your own excellent science and, and asking the CDC leadership to be making decisions based on public health rather than corporate interests. 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for the tremendous amount of information. It was greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you for all your work on the external review. And let me just encourage all of our listeners to, to make sure that they take a look at the, the different documents in the external review. We have a fact sheet. We have an executive summary. We have the full report. It's all documented. Too many deaths, too many left behind. Um, and we will. We absolutely will build another world is possible. And now in this era of pandemics, another world is absolutely necessary. So thank you so much, Lara. Um, and we'll be seeing and talking to each other again very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And yes, you know, those documents are designed to give people the level of information that they feel ready for. The yeah. fact sheet's only about three pages and that's even long. Um, but the I do want to say, you know, for folks that are engaged in this advocacy work, the other thing that the external review is intended to be is a way for you to, you know, quickly search for something and find a citation. It does have over 200 citations at the end. So say, you know, you want a useful statistic about long COVID or about, you know, um, when did the CDC do this thing that, um, you know, trying to search for a few keywords, you should, you should be able to, I'm, I'm hoping that it can be a useful advocacy tool as well, is what I'm trying to say. I think it, I think it very much is. So thank you again. Um, and I will see you down the road. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.